and it does. Finally, we look at the language of their beliefs. Every church, every group will have a language which is peculiar to them. I just gave you one from the Catholic Church, the Eucharist, or transubstantiation. If you're not a Catholic, you look at the person and say, what's that? It's part of the organization. I start talking to you about the anointed, the elect, the 144,000, the other sheep, and you're sitting there and thinking, why? <laughs> Where did that come from? Because it is an in language. By the way, in the smaller groups, <coughs> as their new revelation occurs, and the language changes, you better keep up with it. Because if you don't have the new revealed truths, it will show up in your vocabulary, won't it? And then I know. You're a suspect. It's almost a test. <coughs> a test that is never given, but a test that is applied. So, when we finally get to the end of this business of characteristics, uh, I want to look at some basic assumptions. And I need to move forward faster. First of all, as I said, 90% of the people in this country believe in God, therefore it's going to be much easier for me to go to and talk to you. Much easier. And if I can get you on that assumption, then the next one, that there is a revealed truth by God Paul said it to Timothy. He said, all scripture is inspired of God. Even those that are right now. And are beneficial for teaching, reproving, and the rest of them. Got the book? By the way, this is an authentic Jehovah's Witness. <laughs> so, now that I have you at that stage, then I can get you to the stage where I can get you to believe what the group says, and I can get you to identify the group, in fact, with God. It is the spokesman for God. The Pope is infallible in the teachings of the church. Why? Because he is not going to know. The governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses is sitting out in Bethel, New York. They, they are the representatives of Jehovah God here on earth. And if you say they're wrong, you're not saying the organization is wrong. You're saying God is wrong. How dare you challenge God? You define atheists. Okay. We've already looked at the leadership, so I'm not going to pause too much of this, other than the fact that we know they're very charismatic, they're powerful speakers, they attract people perhaps. They may not be a real charismatic, dramatic speaker. But they may be very good at interpersonal, one-on-one -on -one recruiting. You then move to the ethos of the group. What is the ethic, the work ethic? They do good works. My mother on more than one occasion said, what organization, you can draw the witnesses, what organization could you belong to that would have so many people that are so well? Mormons? <laughs> and she'd say, <laughs> But they took great pride in this because they would rent huge stadiums like Yankee Stadium, bring 150,000 people. It was one of the largest groups ever in 1950 that had ever gathered for a religious group like that. And they left it cleaner than when they arrived. They get their toothbrushes out. And they clean. They get gum off that hasn't been off for years. <laughs> These people that run stadiums know what they're doing when they bring them in and rent them. So you have a strong ethos in terms of that. Morality, very strict. The exception found within the holy book. Sometimes you have to have an addition to the holy book. So the Book of Mormon and the teachings. Addition to the Quran, you get the Hadith, right? And you add Sharia, the law. So there's one scripture I was reading, the Hadith, which says, when praying over the dead, 
be sincere. <laughs> but remember that. <laughs> or if you take the Torah, first five books of the Bible, the Jewish part of the book, really, you have the Talmud, the rabbinical scholars that have looked very carefully, thought about this, and set up a tradition of an interpretation of what the Torah is. I always found it curious that the fundamentalists in this country, though they teach a lot of what the Old Testament bigotry is and bias, yet they never look at the Jewish teachings about what it means. They ignore them. You know, I, I grew up with eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. <laughs> Rabbi say, it is not that, but rather it is the exacting the equivalent of, not the literal plucking out of the eye. That changes the teaching. That changes the just a tiny bit. Or well, the fact that rabbis, according to the teachings in Deuteronomy, are capable of looking at the law that is given within those first five books, and according to the times in which they live, they may change those laws except for the Ten Commandments. Those were written in stone. <laughs> but otherwise, you can change the law. And in fact, that's what Jesus was known for, wasn't he? Can't work on the Sabbath. His apostles did. Ooh, they're working on the Sabbath. And he said, oh, is the law made for man or is man made for the law? Good principle, actually. Even a human law. So we've touched on some of the recruitment techniques. Love bombing is one of the, the big ones. And they bring you in. Now, who is invulnerable to love? Well, OK, so I'm not the most lovable person. But I'll find a person that you love. We'll get you in. But it's called love bombing. And that actually came out of the Moonies. Uh, it is surprising how many people are really vulnerable to this. We think we're invulnerable, but remember they do much of the recruiting, many of these people are recruiting on university campus. These are supposed to be the brightest and the most critical thinking people on earth. Uh, apparently not. And they fall for it. So they know how to use techniques because if they can find you are disenchanted, if you're emotionally or intellectually confused, uh, you're in need of a purpose, you're vulnerable. Jehovah's Witnesses used to have a tactic, which was to go through the obituaries. And the, and the women would do this because you know, the men were more important, more important things. The women would do this by and large, and they would write letters to individuals who had lost their loved ones. And they would include a little magazine or tribe that dealt with death and resurrection, things like that. Yeah, that would comfort me, all right. <clears throat> and I look back at that and I think, that is such an intrusive thing in your grief. It is so intrusive. But they did it at that time. And you, you're vulnerable. That's when you're most apt to change. Sense of purpose. The purpose driven life. Anyone not heard of that book? <laughs> I think at last count in the hardback edition, Warren sold 30 million copies. 30 million copies. He also has the journal, the spiritual day by day advice, the church, the purpose driven church, and he's probably got another book. He's not poor at this point in time, at least. They say you can get rich through Jesus. <laughs> and he does. So, moving ahead, why do you stay in the group? Almost for the same reasons that you join the group. Dependency, you're looking for belonging. Right? 